And so in this series, when I started this series, I'm like, okay, we need something that's going to get us through to beach retreat. God, what do you want to talk about? What do you want us to talk about? And I felt he wanted us to talk about purpose. I'm like, okay, cool. This series will carry us through to beach retreat. No big deal. And then we started walking in it. And all of a sudden, you guys started responding to me. And all of a sudden, this has been a sermon series that I have gotten more feedback, positive feedback, and thank you for that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Positive feedback on the flip side of it going, oh my gosh, God has created me for something great. God has wired me and designed me. I'm not an accident. My life is not a waste. Because our generation, and the millennials have kind of rubbed off on us, our generation has put to bed these questions that we used to ask, which were, how do I make the most money? How do I get the title? How do I get the fame? How do I get the position? And instead, we're asking new questions. We're asking, how can my life make a difference? At the end of the day, when I'm done here, how can I leave a footprint on this earth? And is God okay with my life being, or is God okay with me desiring for my life to have meaning and purpose and value at the end of the day? And the answer to that is resoundingly yes. That he has wired you, he has designed you, he has created you with purpose. And so what we have talked about in this series, just to give a very quick summary, is that all of us, no matter what we do, we could be a baker, we could be a butcher, we could be a candlestick maker, we could be any of these things, and all of us share the exact same purpose, which according to Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, is to know him and to make him known. So everything we do, we do it so that we can bring glory to God. So he says in Colossians chapter 1, 16, that Jesus created everything, Jesus sustains everything, and ultimately everything is for Jesus, which blows the mind of the average American who says, no, 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 everything is created for me and for my pleasure. Everything I work for is for me. And the Bible says, nope, that's not why you were designed. At the end of the day, you were created for him. And if you don't believe that, then you should stop repeating or reciting with me our benediction every Sunday where we say, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Everything has been created by him. Everything is sustained through him. And ultimately, at the end of the day, everything is created for him. That's our purpose. That's what you and I were created for, no matter how we do it. But then the question is, how do we do that? Like in my life, I want to know how I can honor God, how I can bring glory to God in my relationships, how I can bring glory to God in my work, how I can bring glory to God where I live. Like what is God's plan? What is God's will for my life? And that's where it's unique. The how-to is different for all of us. For Brian, it's as an accountant. For Angela, it's as a teacher, right? For, for me, it's up here preaching the Word of God to you on Sundays. For Dave, it's as a chef. For Jen, it's as the world's best real estate agent. For a lot of you guys, it's being businessmen, businesswomen, stay-at-home parents. We all have these different things that we do. This is how we bring glory to God. So each one of us has our own unique tool. And the problem is, for so long as Christians, we've worshipped the tool. And it starts in youth ministry. It starts with youth pastors who all of a sudden put pressure on teenagers saying, what are you going to be when you grow up? What is God's will for your life? Search God's will. Search God's heart for his will. And all of a sudden, the pressure is on what you do or where you live or who you marry. And all of those things are important. And you should search the heart of God for those things. But at the end of the day, the purpose is to know God and make him known, to bring glory to him. The tool is your job. Whatever you do, do it in word or deed for Jesus, giving glory, giving thanks to God the Father through him, according to Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. So this is what we've been walking through in this series, is that Paul is showing us like God's will for your life, God's purpose for your life is not about what you do, which should make everybody breathe. Because I don't know, I mean, seriously, anybody of you guys screwed up by youth ministry in the past? Like, and I had great youth pastors, but it was always about find, discover God's will for your life. And so I went into accounting because I thought that's what I was supposed to do. And so there are days when I'm like, man, I wish I would have gone into accounting. That would have been a lot of fun, sitting and crunching numbers all day. But, but all the pressure was on me to discover what God wanted me to do because that was my purpose. Nobody ever taught me that it was just a tool. And Paul says, it doesn't matter what you do. The purpose is that whatever you do, whether it's way down here at the bottom of the corporate ladder or way up here at the top of the corporate ladder, whether you hate your job or love your job, whatever you do, in word or in deed, do it for the glory of the Father. So tomorrow morning when you go to work, even if you hate your job, you're doing it not just to get a paycheck or to promote yourself to a new level. You're doing it 
for the glory of God, to know Jesus and to make him known. And all of us should be breathing because it means that as long as I am working hard, as long as I am doing it with excellence and these things that we're going to be talking about today, if I am doing these things for a purpose, if the motive of my heart is pure, then my work is sacred. Remember the quote with Tozer over and over again, we're coming back to this quote, that your work is not determined to be sacred or secular based upon what you do, but why you do what you do. So as a pastor, my work is not sacred because I sit up here and teach the word of God. My work is sacred only if the motive of my heart is to bring glory to him. In your work, you might be a chef. You go, my work's just secular work and all I'm supposed to do is create money for the church so the real spiritual sacred people can do the work of the ministry. That's not the Bible. That's not Ephesians 4 at all, okay? What Paul is saying is that if the motive of your heart as a chef or a real estate agent or an accountant or a teacher or a construction worker or whatever you do, if the motive of your heart is I want to bring glory to him, then you, my friend, and your work is just as sacred as my work if my heart is motivated by the same thing. So no matter what you do, and the church has hijacked, hijacked sacred work and said, nope, it's all about the priest, it's all about the pastor. And Paul's like, that is foolishness. All of us have sacred work as long as our motive is correct. Now, what we're doing in this series, what I want, and I, I thought this would be fun. It's like, in this, how do we do this? In our jobs, what do we do in our work to make our work bring glory to God? Like, what's the application of it? Like, give me specifics. Don't give me, like, theoretical ideas or big philosophical concepts. Tell me how I bring glory to God when I go to my 9 to 5 or my 8 to 4 tomorrow. Tell me what to do. And I think the scripture speaks of five things that we should do with our jobs. Number one, be excellent at what we do. We talked about this last week. We're going to continue to talk about it today. Be excellent like Bill and Ted. Be excellent at what you do. Number two, be distinct. Be different than everybody else. In your excellence and in your character, be different. Stand apart. Number three, be faithful. Man, we don't like this one. Trust me, when we get to this one, that's going to be the hardest one. Be committed. Be faithful in your job. Be on time. Do your work. Do your job. Be steady even when you hate your job or your boss. Be faithful. But then we get fun. Week four, be creative. The millennials love that one, right? Be creative. Take all the raw materials this earth has given us and harness them and create something because your heavenly father is a creator and he's created you in his image. So you are invited to be creative. And here's what happens. When we're excellent, when we're distinct, when we're faithful, and when we're creative, you know what it does? It allows this fifth thing to be possible, and that is to be heard. And unfortunately, Christians for too long have said, I'm gonna, in, in work, I'm going to skip these other four areas, and I'm just going to jump to being heard. So the crazy people at St. Augustine that are just screaming with their signs expecting to be heard, why are they not heard? Because these four things prior have not established a platform for them to be heard. And I'm telling you, if in your job you are doing excellence with your work, and you're distinct and you're different, if you are faithful and committed, and if you are creative, all of a sudden there's a platform for the voice, your voice recognizes Jesus' authority to be heard. And so that's what we want to talk about. And in this excellence thing, man, this excellence idea that we gave up last week or we brought to our attention last week, when I thought about this idea of excellence, it, it really was hard for me. It was a big struggle. And you remember why last week is this idea that if you're a Jesus person, if you're a follower of Jesus, like the ways of Jesus are what? They're humility and servanthood. So if you want to follow Jesus, you need to be humble. If you want to follow Jesus, you have to serve. And I'm thinking to myself, well, excellence is opposite of that. Excellence is comp competition, competing to be better than I was or better than somebody else, wanting to not just be great, but to be the greatest. And I'm going, do the, these things butt heads, wanting to honor God with humility, but then also be great at something. And so we open up the scriptures and we open up to Mark chapter 9 where Jesus and his disciples are having a really awkward conversation. You remember that? Jesus is like, hey guys, I'm about to die. And the disciples are in the background going, yeah, I hear you. You're about to die. But we were wondering which one of us is the coolest. Like out of all of us, is it Thaddeus? Is he the coolest? Or is Peter the coolest? Is it Bartholomew? I mean, he's got a pretty cool name. So which one of us is the greatest? And shockingly, I have no idea how I never caught this. Shockingly, Jesus doesn't come by and slap him on the wrist and go, you idiots. Like, you're going to talk about who's the greatest? Like, I'm the greatest. You want to know who's the greatest? The goat is right here, man. The greatest of all times is in your presence. I'm right here. Just shut up. You guys are all losers compared to me. And just shut up. Jesus didn't do that. What did Jesus do? Jesus goes to them. He says, the one who wants to be the greatest must be the least. 
He didn't slap them for wanting to be great. Instead, he's like, you go ahead and desire to be great, but let me teach you what greatness actually is. So Jesus is trying to teach us, hey, it's okay to strive for excellence. It's okay to want to be great at something, but make sure you understand the difference between fame and greatness. I'm not calling you to be famous. I'm calling you to be great. Fame is about me. It's doing things for my attention so people will notice and recognize me. Greatness is using and leveraging every gift that God has given me, maximizing it to serve him and to serve others. That's what it looks like to be great. Any tennis fans in here today? Anybody going home? Steph, she just got back from the U.S. Open, y'all. She was at the U.S. You know how jealous I am? Like, that is Melly and I, when the kids are out and we have, like, a couple bucks, we're like, we are, we're going to the U.S. Open. That's my dream. So if anybody wants to give me a really cool present, we would love to go to Flushing Meadows and go to a nighttime match at the U.S. Open. If you don't watch tennis, watch the U.S. Open and you will be addicted. It's not like Wimbledon where everybody's wearing white and it's proper and the queen is there, which is still awesome. It's chaos. Everybody's drunk. And it's nighttime, and everybody's screaming and hollering, and it's wonderful. But in tennis, and, and I know I know today is the opening day of pro football, so it's either watch Rafa Nadal beat up on Daniel Med Medvedev in the U.S. Open final or watch my Lions lose again, which they will do all season. So I'm going to watch tennis this afternoon. But even if you don't watch tennis, let, let me share with you. You guys heard of Ro uh, Roger Federer, uh, Rafa N Rafael Nadal, and Novak Djokovic, the, the big three of tennis right now. On the women's side, they've got Serena Williams, and that's it, right? So Serena dominates. Her only competition ever has been her sister, um, but she just absolutely dominates. Now, she hasn't dominated the last she, she Yesterday was a bad day for Miss Serena, so it was a bad day. But here's the thing on the men's side I want us to notice. On the men's side of tennis, it's really interesting. Since 2004, the beginning of 2004, there have been 64 Grand Slam finals, or 64 Grand Slams. The Grand Slams are the Australian Open, the French Open, Wimbledon and the US Open. 64 championships. Of those 64, Roger Federer, Rafa Nadal, and Novak Djokovic have won 55 of those 64 Grand Slams. Let that sink in for a minute. That's crazy, right? So Federer has 20. Rafa Nadal, after this afternoon, he's so going to win today. Rafa Nadal is going to have 19, so he's going to be one behind Federer, and Djokovic has 16. Now, of those big three, of those 64 Grand Slams, in the finals, one of those three players have been represented in those Grand Slam finals 61 of those 64 times. 95% of the time over the last 16 years, one of those three have been in the finals. How do, how do you think the other men in the tour feel about these dudes? Like seriously, get out of the way. That, that, that's those statistics. Nine other um, Grand Slam winners have been announced over those 16 years. But Andy Murray has three and uh, Stan Wawrinka has three, so they took up a chunk as well. But think about this era of men's tennis. It's crazy because just 10 years ago, anybody that follows tennis, you've heard of Pete Sampras. Everybody was calling him the greatest of all times. He's American. He's boring as heck, man. All of us that were Agassi fans, we couldn't stand Pete Sampras, so I, I don't like him at all. But everybody's like, he's the greatest of all times. He's won 14 majors. And in 10 years, there's three dudes that have beat him, and they're still playing. So Sampras is an afterthought right now, right? So the statistics are Connor, Borg, and McEnroe, who were the big three for some of us when we were, we were younger, they won 50% of the Grand Slams during their era. These guys are winning 85% of the Grand Slams during this new era, and they're still going. And what makes them better, and I don't think you can convince me otherwise, what makes them better is each other. There, there's this competition with each other. It's not like Roger Federer would have 40 grand slams if Novak and Rafa didn't exist. I think the three of them are like, okay, I've got to get better because of you. There's this desire in them to be excellent. Now, my question is, if they were Christian, are they doing the wrong thing? I, like, I don't know their faith card. I don't, I don't know if they follow Jesus. But if they are followers of Jesus, wouldn't it be like, well, you can't, that's arrogant to be competitive. You need to be humble and not excellent at your job, Right? But we don't, that, 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 it seems silly. And we don't do that with our doctors or our surgeons. You know what I want you to do today, dentist? As you drill my teeth, be average. Just be all right. <laughs> hey, artist, when you paint the million dollar painting for me, do like a C minus job because I'm Christian. And, and I don't want to come across as arrogant. No, what God is defining for us in our jobs, what the expectation is in our job, is to do it 
with excellence because we're not only doing it for our boss or our clients or our other employees or our coworkers. We're doing it for our Heavenly Father who wired you with the gifts and talents and passions that you have. So leverage them and give God your absolute best, not for fame, but for greatness. So we're talking about this in whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it for the glory of God. And the way you can do it is to begin with excellence. So if you're going to your job tomorrow and you're, what's the non-swearing way to say this? And you're half baking it in your job, or you're going through geometry class and you're like, I just need to get through. Can I tell you something? You're not honoring God. God demands your worship in the form of your work that you give your absolute best tomorrow when you go to work. There's no hurricane, so there's no excuse. You're going to work tomorrow. It's not Labor Day. So when you show up, you give your best. Now, excellence plays into the second calling card that we're doing, these five areas. So first of all, be excellent. This is how you bring glory to God in your work. Number two, be distinct. Be different. Some of you wives are poking your husband. You nailed it, husby. You're, like, you're, you're so different. You've got this one covered. But I want us to talk about what it means to be distinct in our work. And I think it begins with excellence. Like you work with a whole bunch of fellow employees and you all have the matching gray or beige cubicle. You're all working on Windows 95 with a big fat mouse and you're just, you're doing your job and all of us are doing the exact same thing. How do you stand out? In this nine to five that's boring, you don't like your job, it's hopefully a stepping stone to get you from here to there. How do you stand out? Well, first of all, it starts with doing your job really, really well. And I believe the second part of it is doing your job with integrity and honor and character. How many of you guys know that in your job, if you just did this integrity and honor and character thing, you would certainly stand out because everybody around you is not working that way. So in a sales department and you're fudging the numbers, right? Or when you're data entering, you're, you're kind of skipping over some things to get the job done quicker. Or you're hiding out in the bathroom 45 minutes at a time to get, let the clock run out. You, there's not integrity. There's not honor. There's, there's not any character in this. And if we would just stick to those things, then we would be distinct. We would be different. I want to share a story with you out of Daniel. If you have your Bibles, go with me to Daniel chapter 1. Um, and it's a really interesting story. Our teenagers have been walking through Daniel um, in youth group, and they got done just a couple weeks ago, so they've heard some of this. But here's what the context, the background of this story is, because it's fascinating. In 605 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon is about to invade the southern kingdom of Israel. So Israel's divided into two kingdoms. They've had a civil war, and there's a split. So up north is Israel, and down south is the kingdom of Judah with the capital city of Jerusalem. So the temple is down south, in Judah. And King Nebuchadnezzar is going to come and he's going to raid the territory or the kingdom of Judah and he's going to occupy the people or he's going to bring the people back to Babylon, bring them in as slaves, and he's going to pillage the temple and he's going to pillage all their goods and he's going to bring them back. Now the interesting thing as we find out in the text is that God is the one who's behind all this. God is the one doing this because over and over again these silly Israelites start worshiping other gods and turn their backs on God and God's like I am going to get your attention once and for all I'm going to put you into exile I'm going to let Nebuchadnezzar do what he wants to do and I'm going to punish you but I'm doing it so that I can get your attention now what's fascinating about him bringing these guys into slavery is he's going to do it in three different phases so three separate phases. He's going to bring a partial, uh, uh, small, small group of people first, then a larger chunk of people, then finally a large chunk. And at the end of the day, everybody's going to be in Babylon. Everybody except the Samaritans. And the Samaritans are going to be left behind, and the Samaritans are mixed breeding. While they're gone, they're going to be mixed breeding so that when all the Jews come back home, there's now the Samaritan people that are half-breeds, and they're looked upon for the rest of Jewish history. So if you're ever wondering why the Samaritans are looked down upon, it's because of this event right here. So let's turn to Daniel chapter 1, and let's read through this text. It's an amazing story, um, and, and let's walk through this. So in the third year, starting with verse 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem, and he took it over. He besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his own God. So these articles, the candlesticks, the things that were in the temple are now in temple of a foreign God in Babylon and put into the treasure of the house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, that's a great name, Ashpenaz, chief of the court officials, so basically the chief of staff, 
to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. So the first wave of people being brought in are family members or young men from the royal family. And he, this is how they started to choose them. This is awesome. Young men without any physical defect and they are handsome. So the good looking ones from the noble family. Can you imagine being like the noble brother that wasn't as attractive as everybody else? And you're like, ah, oh, I get to stay. You got to go. See you good looking. So he's picking the ones that are good enough to be in like the Judean fireman annual calendar. He's like, come on over. We, your team Babylon, please come on over. And, and now here's the thing. Here's the catch. We're sitting there going, man, I want to be left behind. I want to be the one that is staying in Jerusalem, see you big brother, ha ha, good looking, ha ha, finally, right? Finally, something goes against you. But even this is for them, because eventually everybody's gonna be brought into captivity, and those that are brought first are getting the best houses, the best food, the best communities, the best neighborhood, the best training. You wanna go first. And so these guys are going. And so the interesting thing is they're not just going because they look like Kardashians. They're going because of something else. The verse continues. These are the young men that also show aptitude for every kind of learning. They're well-informed, they're quick to understand, and they're qualified to serve in the king's palace. And this guy, this man, this chief of staff is going to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. So more than just being beautiful, these young nobles were brought over because they were smart and they were excellent at their job. So whatever they were doing in Judah, they were really good at it, they were noticed, and they were brought over because the king knew that he could train them the language of the Babylonians and the ways and the culture of the Babylonians because they were going to integrate themselves into this. So it's, this kind of flips Christianity on its head. Because for a long time, Christianity has been saying, we get promoted because of the favor of God and the favor of God alone, right? So I'm going to just sit here. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to work hard. But the favor of God is upon me because I go to church and I serve with the kids or I serve with the teenagers or I greet at the door. And so the favor of God is going to be on me and at work I'm going to be promoted. And what we see over and over through scripture is, no, it's kind of on its head. In order to get promoted, you're going to have to work really hard and actually be good at what you do. Crazy concept, right? So if you want to be promoted to here, you've got to be really good here. You've got to be excellent. You've got to stand apart. You've got to have distinction. So this is what's going on in this story. Verse 5, the king assigned to them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter in the king's service. So think about this. The king, they're getting the food from where? Where are they getting the food from? The king's table. That, that's a big deal, right? So, like, in our country, it might not be a good example because our president eats McDonald's. That's, like, his favorite thing. But, but here, it's the king's table where people are probably struggling for food. These young men are brought into Babylon, and they're like, hey, man, dude, filet mignon, prime rib wrapped in bacon, and the absolute best wine you can, like, the wine's probably, like, 600 years old, and you're going to drink it in goblets, and it, oh, my gosh, it's going to be amazing. So this is what's being served, and these young men are going to be trained for three years, and at the end of it, they're going to be hooked up with sweet killer jobs. Like, they're going to have really good jobs, high-paying jobs, working for the king. Verse 6, among those who were chosen were some from Judah, and these are their names, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official then gave them new names, and he named them after Babylonian gods. So to Daniel, he gave the, name, gave the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Have you ever caught that? Like after chapter 1, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, well, I'm sorry, Hananiah, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are now known by their Babylonian names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So if you grew up in Sunday school and church, you know these dudes that later on get thrown into the fiery furnace as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego by their Babylonian names. But for whatever reason, Daniel gets to stay Daniel. Like nobody in here, Daniel, you're not named after Belshazzar. Like we, we don't know him as Belshazzar. So for whatever reason, that's just an odd and end that Daniel gets to maintain his name, but his three buddies, they're like, sorry, man, you get Babylonian God names. And there's no point to that other than that's interesting. Verse eight, Daniel resolved, this is interesting. Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. So he looks at this food, it's probably salivating. Like, yeah, that, that prime rib, that looks, that looks delicious. Like medium rare, horseradish, baked potato with sour cream. I do this to you every week. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you got a tall glass of wine, red wine. Yeah, man, that looks good. But here's the problem. Here's the catch. All of that food had been sacrificed for the worship of pagan gods 
and he knows it. He's like, I cannot eat the food that has been offered as a sacrifice to a pagan god. And so he says, I cannot defile myself with this. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in any way. Verse 9, now God had caused the official to show favor. So now God steps in and puts his favor in. Because Daniel is showing himself to be excellent in work and high in character. So then God shows up with the favor. It's not that Daniel was lazy and Daniel's like, I'm going to eat the meat and I'm going to eat the baby back ribs even though we're not allowed to eat pork. I, I, no, God's favor didn't start there. God's favor came after Daniel showed himself to be excellent and of high character. And he gave this guy favor and compassion for Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? So he's thinking if Daniel doesn't eat, he's going to look sick and I'm going to get in trouble because you didn't eat your food. The king would then have had my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, he said this, please test your servant for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. There's a sentence that has never been repeated in the history of mankind. Any dude's like, dude, you know what? I don't want the filet and the bacon and the wine. Instead, I'll take Brussels sprouts and water for 10 days. Bring it on. So this is what's going on. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So let us just eat vegetables. That's what he's saying. Verse 14. So this guy agrees to this and he tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. Now, part of me wants to say, wow, that was God. Part of me also knows science. Like for 10 days, if you are feasting like a pig on like prime rib and bacon and baked potatoes and wine, you have the meat sweats at the end of the 10 days. And Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are over here on a 10-day cleanse. They look amazing at the end of these 10 days. So this is what he's saying. He's like, compare us and see how this all tests out at the end. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. So because of their faithfulness, check out what God rewards them with. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could now understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into service, into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal, none, to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about with which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Now, for time's sake, I'm not going to read to you Daniel 2 and Daniel 6, but God does this over and over with Daniel. Over and over again, Daniel's faithful. He refuses to bow. He continues to pray. He, he refuses to worship the foreign god. He refuses to eat the meat. Everything in the character where everybody else is going this way, he's like, I can't do that. I can't do that. I know, I know it would allow me to fit in. I know this could get me in trouble, but I'm going to do it differently. And let's see what happens in all of this. Now, I don't know the story, but do you think from that point on, all the men were fed vegetables? Like, there were probably some angry dudes like, hey, look how good they look. Now, everybody, all you get is vegetables. But the main thing that's being done here is what they're doing, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, is they're being different. They're being distinct. And they're not being crazy. They're not trying to bring attention to themselves. They're just living with character. They're just living with integrity and honor. Something different than anybody else. They're like, I will not defile myself, and I will not defile my God. So when you go into your workplace tomorrow, what sets you apart? First of all, it should be excellence. And second of all, are you taking advantage of the system? Are you taking advantage of your boss? Are you taking advantage of your boss, boss's lack of knowledge? Are you taking advantage of the situation? Are you lying? Are you cheating? Are you manipulating? What are you doing? And let's say, I will not defile my Lord. I will not defile me in this way. So this is what's going on with Daniel. And over and over again, the favor of the Lord is poured out on Daniel, not first, but after he makes these decisions. So Daniel is promoted over and over again, not just because he's a God follower, but because he does a really good job. And this turns Christianity on its head because we're like, no, it's all the favor of God. It's all the favor of God. And God's like, no, it's because they're really good at their job. They're working hard and they're excelling. I, where do I, let me go with this, and I'll be very careful with this. And th you don't know this, this person. This was over 20 years ago, but I worked for a man 
who we had Sunday morning service and we had Sunday night service. And he'd have to preach twice a day, which would be really hard. He'd have to preach two different messages um, during the day. And I don't know if what he did on Sunday mornings, but I know what his Sunday evening method was. And that was at 5.30, and it's because I caught him doing this. At 5.30, so 30 minutes before the service, he would go into his office and he would pull a book off of his shelf. And it was a book, a published book of sermon manuscripts or sermon outlines. And he would take that sermon outline over to the copy machine and he would copy it. And then he would take that photocopy and he would take it to the pulpit and he would attempt to preach it without even reading it over. And I'm looking at it going, so I'm a rookie. I, I'm brand new. I, I, this is my first ministry gig. I'm like, is, is this how it's done? Because I've been taught something differently. I've been taught you work with your sermons. You pray over your sermons. You work hard and you study and you write and you rewrite and you rewrite and then you practice it and you mold it and shape it. And this guy's like, nope, photocopy and go. Now it's a Pentecostal church. And if he started going too fast and tripping over his words because he didn't know what the words said because he hadn't read them yet. If he started tripping over his words, he'd just start speaking in tongues. I'm like, mm, that doesn't feel right. Like there's something in this vibe that's not good. And I'm looking at that and, I'm, and I remember People would think, you know what, it doesn't matter, especially in, in that kind of setting, it doesn't matter how much effort you give into your job, because if the Holy Spirit is in it, he's going to do whatever he wants to do. And so God's favor is going to be on that. I'm like, that didn't sit well with me, and now I know why, because it's not biblical. God expects us, the pastors, the accountant, the engineer, the, the parent, the student, he expects all of us to give our best with high character and then watch his favor pour out on us. There's a quote from, um, I got to read her name, Dorothy Sayers in an essay called Why Work? And this is what she says, and I wrote this on Facebook a couple weeks ago. It says, and the, the band can go ahead and come on up. The official church wastes time and energy and moreover commits sacrilege and demanding that secular workers should neglect their proper vocation in order to do Christian work. So the, the theory is, stop doing your secular work so that you can do the real work of the church. By which she, the church, means ecclesiastical work. Now this is the most important sentence. The only Christian work is good work well done. The only Christian work is good work well done. Let the church see to it that the workers are Christian people and that they do their work well as to God. Then all the work will be Christian work, whether it is church embroidery or sewage farming. As Jacques Maritain says, if you want to produce Christian work, be a Christian and try to make a work of beauty into which you have put your heart. Do not adopt a Christian pose. You know, in our house, this is fascinating to me. We're not that big of a church. We have business owners professional business owners, professional artists, CEOs, lawyers, doctors, chefs. Do you know we have a AAA baseball player that is this close to being brought up by the Baltimore Orioles into the big leagues in our house? Now here's the question. Do all of us that are doing these things need to stop doing what we're doing and what we're good at and what we're passionate about and start doing what I'm doing? Because it's sacred. Because it's meaningful. And the answer to that is, of course, a resounding no. The only Christian work is good work well done. So whatever you do tomorrow in word or deed, do it really, really well. Do it with passion, do it with excellence, knowing that you're serving your client, knowing that you're serving your family, knowing that you're serving other people, and knowing that you're serving your Heavenly Father. Do it with everything you've got. And do it with integrity. Do it with honor. Do it with character. And watch what God does in your life. Now, when we started this series, and then I'm done, when, I, when we started this series, one of my fears, one of my concerns is that we were going to think that this was a morality series. Like, hey, when you go into work tomorrow, Patrick, be a good little boy. Like, like eat your veggies, right? And, and do your job really, really well. And that's what Jesus is calling you to. And I want to tell you something that I tell our children's workers. Whenever we, like with Lindsay, when, when we first hired Lindsay, one of the first things I told her, and I hope she remembers this, one of the first things I told her was when we're teaching our kids, we are not... We are not teaching them morality. You don't bring your kids in here every Sunday for us to go, okay, when you get home tonight, brush your teeth. Do well in school tomorrow, okay? Honor your mom and dad, even though it's scriptural, do this. What our starting point is with our children in children's ministry and in our youth ministry, and it should be in here as well, is the gospel. We want our little ones to know, listen, I need Jesus. Even as a little guy, even as a little girl, I need Jesus. 
Like Jesus saves me. Jesus rescues me from myself. Jesus rescues me from my sin. Jesus has paid a price that I could not pay for me. Jesus has given everything for me. And then when I receive him, you know what? Now I honor him and I worship him. How? By being a good boy or being a good girl, by honoring my mom, by honoring my dad. Now let's adultify it for a minute. Everything is about the gospel. It's not about being a good worker. It's about Jesus, that he has saved you, that he has set you free, that he has liberated you and welcomed you into his family. And now as a family member, we worship him and we honor him by doing excellent work and by, by, by being men and women and students with high integrity, saying no to the easy way out, saying no to cheating, saying no to lying, and saying, you know what, I'm going to honor you in word or in deed. This is my act of worship, is when I go to work tomorrow, I will honor you because it's about the gospel. It's not about, not about being a good boy or being a good girl. Do you think that would shape the American church if in children's ministry we started and said it's about the gospel, not about not lying or cheating or stealing? It's not about the Ten Commandments. It's about the gospel. And from this position of knowing what Jesus has done, we do all of these things to worship and honor him. And it changes everything. So tomorrow, whatever you do, in word or in deed, honor him with excellence and distinctiveness and watch what he does in your life. Amen? Well, bow your heads with me and then we're going to stand and we're going to sing a song and we'll be dismissed. Father, we love you and thank you that in our lives you have called us to work, that work is not a punishment, it's not a disease, it's not something that we should um, reject or spit upon, but it's a gift to create as you have created, to represent you with honor and integrity and excellence, to worship you with our word, with our deed, in everything we do, because first and foremost, you gave your everything for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you stand with us and sing?